On to our next speech by Abu Musab, brother Abu Musab. Now, what do you think when I say the word role models? Any takers? None, okay, good. Role models nowadays, they're mostly, you know, the last media, the last guy who did some crazy stunt or anything, or that Jake Paul fan who like burnt himself or anything. But really, when we follow these role models which we're exposed to on the media, they can often lead us to the wrong path, to misguidance. To talk about more about how to identify our correct role models and you know, to follow them, I would like to invite Brother Abu Musab to give the final lecture for this day. <clears throat> Was there a cockroach? No, no, it's folded up. Oh, folded up, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to read um, from my notes. I usually don't like to read from my notes because they restrict me and I'm more of an extemporaneous person. But because there are some um, hidden jokes and I don't want to miss them, I'm going to read. If you miss them anyways, I'll be heartbroken. But then again, who cares, right? I mean, it's just the speaker being heartbroken. In an age where the number of role models have exceeded the number of those who take them as role models, one can easily find himself adoring a complete loser in every sense of the word. Even though the people have placed this person on a pedestal so high, you will trip trying to climb it even if you were the non-existent Spider-Man. That was the first. At least one smiled. I have a great temptation which I will resist to name so many of these people that have been taken as role models who the only relation to role models they have is that they roll like a model. Okay, everybody got that one? Yes. Not exactly the ideal state of a Muslim. Um, the sad part is not only uh, humans have accepted these people as role models, they have also launched a never-ending attack on the finest role models the world has ever known. And yes, I'm talking about the prophets of Allah. And on top of the list, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an example of mercy, kindness, affection, compassion. He alayhi salatu salam had said in an authentic tradition, I am the leader of the children of Adam and this is no boast. And we have to understand the meaning of this hadith. Because when you say, I am the leader of everybody, this is in some way, technically, boasting. You are showing off. However, there's a difference between someone making the statement out of their own arrogance and desire, and a person who's saying this because this is an amana. It's a trust that Allah placed on them to convey to the people so we can give that person their due status. And there isn't anyone in this world who can say, I am the leader of the children of Adam, except the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone else who says it is bogus, is exaggerating, is fronting as they say. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he made that statement, he was trying to tell us Muslims, if you want to look up to someone, then upon you is the one who is the best among everybody. And it is very sad that we have found everybody else, almost everybody else, to be a role model. And we've sidelined in, an, in a very unfortunate manner the Prophet ﷺ himself. Perhaps it is because we don't, we don't know him properly. I would say maybe our excuse, the reason why Muslims are not as adamant on 
imitating and emulating and following the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ is because they didn't know him well enough. And when you don't know someone well enough, you tend to distance yourself from them. And when you know someone very well, you become attached. This is why if I were to ask some of you young men and, and uh, women about your role model or your idol as they call them nowadays, and idol is a problematic term in and of itself, if it was a football player or a basketball player or a movie star or a singer, I'm assuming that you're completely off track, yani. you will probably be able to say a lot about this person. At least from my experience, when I speak to someone who has taken one of these people as role models, they know their date of birth and how they grew up and their you know, early uh, struggles and how they overcame these struggles and how they reached this point and what kind of cars they drive and how many houses they live, uh, they live in and how many mansions and uh, so many cities and so on and so forth. You're baffled. Of course, if it's a sports player, then you get into statistics. You know? How many field goals or how many goals they scored or how many touchdowns depending on or cricket. I don't know how cricket goes, but how many times he hit the ball that it bounced off the floor, unlike baseball. I mean, you would know a lot of stuff. And because you know so much stuff, you start appreciating or admiring this person. But if I were to ask the average Muslim to tell me something about the life of the Prophet ﷺ, I think very few will be able to enumerate a few occasions that they're familiar with and then they will go blank. And that's our problem. Had we known him, then we would have loved him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he deserves to be loved. And when you love him, you will not help and you cannot help but try to imitate him. I admit that it is a challenging task. Because the Prophet ﷺ exemplified the finest of character that we can't even come close to. When Allah says to him, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are really upon a great moral character, behavior. When, when Allah gives him that endorsement, it is very difficult for one of us to get even close. But we are supposed to make an attempt. It is obligatory on us to make an attempt. So let us discuss something about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I would like to cite the incident that was narrated by Anas ibn Malik that had to do with the Prophet's mercy alayhi salatu wasalam, specifically to his family. And this is because the son of the Prophet alayhi salam was dying. Does anyone know what the name was? What's his son's name? Yes, you don't have to uh, wait for me. Just if you know the name, Ibrahim. His son's name was Ibrahim. He was on the verge of death. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbed him and he smelled him like, like usually, you know, adults, you know, they, they bring a baby closer. There's this kind of compassion and, and love. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cried. So much so that Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you? You? As in, a person who believes in the Qadr of Allah, a person who accepts the Qadr of Allah, he thought that crying suggests displeasure with the Qadr of Allah, right? It's almost like you're not happy with what Allah decreed. And you don't expect that from the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam. However, the issue was, in the understanding of, Abdur, of the Sahabi. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered him by saying, O oh, Ibn Auf, this is mercy. What you're seeing, meaning this expression, this crying, this is something that is not unmanly. Meaning it's not like a behavior that is not befitting a man. It is an indication that Allah placed mercy in my heart. Then he said that the eyes shed tears and the heart feels sadness. Uh, but we only say that which is pleasing to our Lord. Surely Ibrahim, looking at his baby, alayhi salam, with you leaving us, we are saddened. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi exemplified to Sahaba uh, uh, a side of him that they did not know existed. And that is the, the side of the father, the, the role of a father. Because even though he's the messenger of Allah for the ummah, he's also a father and a husband and a leader. 
and so many different roles he played alayhi salatu wasalam. So this was the type of character. Now we see some people are hard-hearted. In fact, at the time of Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah there was an incident of this nature where one sheikh, one sheikh's son died. And he started laughing. His son died. He was laughing. And he was completely fine. So the people were, you know, were confused about his reaction. And they said, how, how, can, you, how can you laugh when your son died? He said that this is a contentment. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with the qadr of Allah. I am satisfied with the qadr of Allah. So they were baffled. And they thought, man, this, this is a, a great thing. This person has a better يعني, acceptance of the decree of Allah than the Messenger of Allah because the Messenger of Allah cried. And this man is, is happy and laughing. So they went to Shaykh al sabah ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, who was incarcerated. He was imprisoned for no crime he committed. Rahimahullah bi rahmati al wasi'ah. And they said, look, we have an issue. There's this man in, in town that, whose son died. And this, he's laughing, but the Messenger of Allah والسلام, cried. So how do we understand that? Is he better than the Messenger of Allah? And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah explained, he said, look, this man's heart is tiny. It's small. And if he had to, if he had to accommodate or had to choose between mercy and contentment, there was only enough room for him to be content with the Qadr of Allah. So he was laughing. Whereas the heart of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi was vast. It accommodated accepting the decree of Allah. That's why he said, وَلَا نَقُولُ إِلَّا مَا يُرْضِي رَبُّنَا He said, we don't say except that which is pleasing to Allah. But it was also vast to accommodate that mercy, which comes as a result of, you know, you crying when someone passes away, which is a natural reaction. As long as your heart is content with the qadr of Allah, you, what you don't want to do is what some crazy people do right now is say, why? People love this. Why? Why me? Why not? Who are we to say why to Allah? And that's what a Muslim never goes. Not just verbally expressing that. No, no. Psychologically, mentally, you don't want to think, why me? Because people that were far better than us were tested in greater ways. Just look at Ayyub alayhi salam. Or look at Yunus being, being in the belly of the whale for so long before, before Allah Azza wa Jal saved him. And look what Ibrahim had to go through being thrown into the fire. And you know, look what Musa had to go through with Fir'aun or Harun. And the list goes on of the finest of people having to struggle on a much bigger level than we could ever struggle. So but that was never the attitude of a believer. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not revengeful. Um, Aisha asked him once, has there come a day upon you that is more difficult or worse than the day of Uhud? Because Uhud was a, was a very difficult day for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, there was a time where I presented myself to the chief of Ta'if. Ta'if, you know, is in Saudi Arabia. They did not respond to me the way I wanted them to respond. And I left and I was in a state of anxiety. And I didn't gain comp composure till I got to the uh, till I got to the people, and they they hurt him. Alayhi salatu salam. Eventually, Allah subhanahu wa taala sent an angel, the angel of the mountains, and he said, "I am the angel of the mountains, and I have been sent by your Lord. You command me. If you command me, I will crush them with the two mountains, because Taif was surrounded with mountains." He said, because of the way they treated you, all you have to do is command me. I'm the, the, the angel of the mountains and I am under your command by the will of Allah. If you will, I will crush them with the mountains. And the Prophet wasallam, even though he had this opportunity, he said, my hope is not to destroy these people. Not that any harm should come to them. My hope that Allah will bring out of their loins a group of individuals that shall worship Allah and associate nothing with Him. And sure enough, from those people came the, those who believed in Allah and worshipped Him alone. One of us perhaps would have opted for the revenge option. Would have wanted the revenge 
as a retaliation for the mistreatment. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't revengeful. Now, of course, when I'm saying this, brothers and sisters, I want you to compare this character to whoever your role model is. And tell me whether you think they can match or they come close. I mean, some of these people make stupid amount of money. It's just ridiculous how much money they make. Some of these athletes, 200,000 euros a week or some crazy number a week. You know what? You, when one of us will spend his whole life working, they make it in one week of just running around with a ball. It's pretty wild. And then they give back in charity. And what they give back in charity after the taxes that they run away from and all types of nonsense that they get involved in is nothing. And then we're like, oh, this is the big sheikh. Sheikh Ronaldo. No, no, Sheikh Messi. And then we have a fight about who's the sheikh between Ronaldo and Messi. Well, let me tell you something. Neither one of them is a sheikh. At the end of the day, they might do some good. But if you look at their overall lifestyle, minus their athleticism, it's nothing really to, to look forward to. It's nothing that will put you in al-firdaus. It's nothing that's going to get you closer to Allah. It's nothing that will even guarantee you salvation on Yawm al-Qiyamah. And so we set aside the Prophet ﷺ and follow that. That's pretty wild. The Prophet ﷺ, and that is so important. And to me, this is one of the biggest pain points in my experience with fellow Muslims. And the one that breaks my heart the most. And the one that is most difficult to deal with. And the most sensitive. And the one that you have the most challenging time even speaking about but that said with all this introduction I would like to address it because it is completely relevant in a hadith in the Sunan of Abi Dawood narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to us and he saw a man whose hair was disheveled. His hair was all over the place. Does this man not find anything with which he can manage his hair? Keep his hair under control? And in the same hadith, he saw another man whose wardrobe was dirty. He said, does this man not find anything with which he can wash his clothes? And this was authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah. Here, this here my friends is an indication of the status of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in regards to cleanliness and appearance. First of all, we have many narrations where they, when they held his hand, whenever they would shake the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, they said, we've never touched any brocade, any silk, which was smoother than the hand of the Prophet ﷺ, nor did we ever smell any type of perfume that was better than the smell of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ, even though he grew his hair, he grew his hair in a reasonable manner and he was taken care of. He used to look after his hair. And he said, whosoever has hair, let him take care of it. By the way, I have more hair than you do. I'm not bald. I choose to be bald. Meaning if I let my hair grow, I would have an afro like a mop within a few months and you would not recognize me. You'll say, who's this stick inside of this hair? But I choose it because to me, to me, it's easier to manage than having long hair. It's a personal choice. And Islam doesn't force you to grow your hair or shave your head. What it does force you to do is, if you have hair, look after it. If you want to remove it, remove all of it. Don't have what they call qaza, which is this very popular hairstyle where they shave half of it and they let that other, I don't know how to describe it. That other part, just on top. It looks like somebody dropped, like, you know, when you go to the barber and then they have all the hair on the floor. It just feels to me like they just gathered it all together. Then they just glued it on his head. 
And the dude walks around like, you know, the coolest person on earth. It's like, what is this on your head, bro? I mean, the people who have this hairstyle, the cool people, at least they bother to put some gel. You know, they have it here shaved and here they have somewhat combed and fixed. Just to leave it like you just woke up from sleep and walk around. As soon as we see you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, it's a problem. You want to have a hairstyle, you're too lazy to take care of it? Spare us. Go bald. It's just, I mean, of course it takes a long time to shave it, but at least it's maintained. You can have it on number one, number two, number three, whatever you like. But you, can, you have to look after yourself and you cannot smell nasty. Straight up. I know this because, look man, when we speak about da'wah, da'wah can take hundreds of forms. Hundreds of forms. I will give you the example of the airplane because I travel often. And when we travel, the, the airplane, whichever airplane it is, is often a combination of Muslims and non-Muslims. And it is very sad, it's very sad to say that the people that look the worst and smell the worst are the Muslims. And the people that somehow manage to take care of themselves the best and look the, and smell the best are the non-Muslims. And we've accepted this to be the norm. We've accepted this as, as okay. It is not okay. It is not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. So when people look at Muslims and they see them uncivilized, then this automatically reflects on us. And believe it or not, if they have like a bar of interest in Islam, you just lost like two dashes right there. And we continue to then, if you act in a silly way, I've seen Muslims do the craziest stuff. I've seen Muslims who look like they, I don't know where they just came from. He would open the compartment, remove someone's luggage and put his. Like it's his father's airplane. And we all happen to be there by mistake. And the people are like, are you serious? And he just looks at them like they don't exist and he just goes sits in the seat. As soon as the airplane lands, and the, the pilot is still saying, please remain seated. Oh, everybody unbuckles and they start, Ya Sheikh, Ya Amme, Erham Ahlak, sit down. Let's chill out. Okay, you stood up first. You're going to jump from the window? <laughs> or when they see you, they're going to give you special access to the VIP lounge? You're going to wait in line like everybody else, leave the plane with everybody else. What is the point of running in hasty? This is an example. If the Prophet Sallallahu were in this condition, he saw us, it is not something that is satisfying. These are examples of how silly we can be. And this is very harmful to the da'wah. Sometimes your da'wah is keeping your mouth closed. Your da'wah is gestures, smiles, kindness, appreciation, consideration towards others. And when you have an Isl Islamic appearance, then it's a win-win situation. Khalas, the message has been delivered. You don't have to say anything. They know, they can tell. They can tell whether we're Arabs or from the subcontinent or even if, if it's a Westerner revert, they can identify a Muslim for the most part. It's just, it's just something that you can spot. But we see today, this is neglected. A person looks shabby, they smell in, in an unpleasant way, and his attitude is like, brother, I want Jannah. It's just that you're too concerned with materialism in the world. No, Habibi. Nice try. Nice try. Try again. Because if we had evidence from the Prophet's life, alayhi to, to support your, your stance, I'll give you two thumbs up. But you won't find it. You'll find the opposite of that. And the Prophet's way, alayhi you know, his, his general approach was kindness. His general approach was extremely soft in his... When he spoke to people, when, the, when that Arabian, uh, the, the, what you call it, the Bedouin came and urinated in the masjid. You, you guys know the hadith, right? How did the Prophet react, alayhi salam? He was so kind to him. But when this man came with his hair, he said, can this man not find anything to keep his hair under control? And this man can't find anything to keep his clothes clean? You would say this is not the standard of the Prophet, alayhi salam, because the situation necessitated that. Just like when he saw a man with a ring, a gold ring, he snatched it out of his hand and threw it on the floor. He said, does one of you put a ring of fire around his finger? 
So there were times when the Prophet ﷺ was a little more firm and, and stern in his reaction. And you will find this to be the case when it had to do with these type of etiquettes. The etiquettes that have to do with our daily behavior. And so when we want to understand a role model, then you want a full-fledged role model. Someone whom you can emulate and follow in every aspect of life. In his relationship with Allah, the Prophet ﷺ was the best. In his relationship with his wives, the Prophet ﷺ was the best. In his relationship with his companions, the Prophet ﷺ was the best. In every respect, he was the best. And all we do is try to come close. We aim and try to come as close to the target as possible. But if you don't have the Prophet ﷺ on your list of role models, it is a disaster. And you're missing out. Because whosoever you will follow will fail you. And I will conclude with the famous ayah. Who knows the ayah that I would like to cite in relation to friends or who you befriend or who you can take as someone to follow and then what will happen on the last day. I'll give you the first word. Yawma. Naam. Ya waylata. Jazakallahu khairan. On the day where the oppressor will bite on his hand, and that signifies regret. When you have such great anxiety and regret, you bite on your hand. On that day, when the person who was oppressive will bite on his hand, and he will say two things. Ya laytani takhathu ma'ar rasooli sabila. I wish I had taken a path with the messenger. Ya waylata, woe to me had I not taken such and such person as a companion. And this is for the actual companion who even identifies your existence and acknowledges your ex existence. Imagine the role model who if he saw you would be like, who in the world are you? Some of these people that you adore, if they saw you, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even bother to look at you. It's like, who are you? Get out of my way. And you're like dying over him or her. So you have to realize that these choices of these role models will come back to bite you pretty hard. So make sure that you make the right choice. Everything that we say might sound complex or difficult. Wallahi, it is not. It is easy to whomever Allah makes it easy to. And if you ask Allah sincerely, and if you make an effort, Allah promised, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Those who strive and struggle in our cause, those who make an effort, we will surely guide them to our path. And for and eternally, Allah Azza wa Jal will support the muhsineen, those good doers or those who excel. So I remind myself and you to reconsider who you've been, you know, going crazy over. And just like you're interested in learning about those people, you owe it to yourself to read more about the biography of the Prophet ﷺ. How many of you are familiar with the book, The Sealed Nectar? By Imam Mubarak Fuli, rahimahullah. MashaAllah. Sisters, only three? Five, six, twenty, hundred. Who has read the whole book? Impressive. I'm content. Alhamdulillah. The fact that there are a few individuals who have read the whole book is a, an actual exciting piece of information to me. And those who have not, give it a shot. Go through the life of the Prophet ﷺ and see how you would love and learn to love him and appreciate him. And once you connect with him in this particular way, then rest assured that it will become easier for you to act like him. And remember that we will fall short. It's a disclaimer. Just because we don't reach our target doesn't mean we surrender and put up the white flag. Our whole life is actually trial and error. Our whole life is trying, failing, re recovering, repenting, and starting again. 
until we meet Allah. As long as we meet Allah in this cycle, Wallahi, you're good to go. If any one of us meets Allah in this cycle of sinfulness, repentance, starting over, sinfulness, repentance, starting over, then you're actually following the path of life that Allah decreed for us. The problem is when we go to sinfulness, 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 and there's no repentance and there's no starting over. We're just indulge and indulge until the shaitan tells you oh you're a hypocrite you're an evil muslim you shouldn't pray what's the point of praying why are you praying and you're fooling yourself you deserve you deserve the worst things in the world and then you believe the shaitan you say yeah you know you got a point let me fix myself first then i will start praying again you know what happens after you come out saying islam what allah who bro i'm an atheist bro yeah, man, I'm, I'm so smart now. I read a couple of articles on, you know, online and it sounded so, you know, sophisticated and it sounds really appealing. Yeah, yeah. And this person has no idea what they're talking about. Atheist? Really? You know, atheism is widespread. It happens and it comes to those who enter that cycle of sinfulness and they don't get themselves out. And the shaitan will gradually, huh? Slowly but surely, try to lure you in until you submit. Level one, level two, level three. And I'm not talking about Fortnite. Because when I first heard it, I thought it was Fortnite. I was like, really? What is this? Everybody farts at the same time. Turned out it was Fortnite. And I thought it was Fort Morning. I said, how come there's no Fort Morning? How come it has to be at night? Because everybody's playing in the morning. Anyways, these are my jokes about Fortnite. You don't have to use them again. It's, you go level by level until the shaitan completely takes over. This is why we must always reset. And when we sin, we return to Allah. I, make, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make that easy for us. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.